Welcome everybody to this webinar put on by the Center on PBIS. Uh, my name is Kent McIntosh. I'm an associate professor at the University of Oregon. And joining me is Dr. Ron Denise, who is a research associate at the University of Oregon. And both of us are affiliated with the center. Um, we're going to be talking about equity in school discipline for the next hour, and we're very happy that you've been able to join us. As you can see here, I just want to give you a little bit of an orientation if you're following along live. Uh, you can see on the top right corner, you can see the files that we're going to mention, so you can download those, including the PowerPoint for this presentation. You'll also see on the right side a chat box, and if you wouldn't mind starting, by saying your name and what organization you're representing uh, on there, and then any questions that you have through, we'll try to monitor that chat box as well. So you can start right now by putting that information in. The other thing that you're seeing right now is a poll, and you'll see a few polls throughout, um, and this is live, so go ahead and mark whether you're representing an LEA district or an SEA. Okay, great. We can see about two-thirds uh, LEAs and one-third SEAs. Thank you very much for letting us know. Just so you all know, um, this is going to be equally applicable. What we're primarily talking about is how to assist schools and school districts in implementing effective practices for enhancing equity in school discipline. And so when you're uh, representing from an SEA, you're just going to see how you're going to do to support those people out there. All right. So what we're going to do in the next hour is talk through a few different areas. Number one, we're going to just talk briefly about disproportionality in school discipline, uh, but we're going to move very quickly to what to do now that we've acknowledged that there's a challenge, and we're going to do as much as we can to have some time for questions and answers. And like I said, uh, once everyone has gone through and entered their information in the chat box, you can start asking questions and we'll see what we can do to answer those as we go along. Although we do have a lot of slides, so we'll see how well we do with that. I also want to acknowledge the great work of this fantastic group of people from the Disproportionality Work Group. Both Rhonda and I work um, with a really, really talented group of people who uh, have done a lot to build much of the materials that we're uh, going to showcase today. So even though we're the two on the webinar, um, we're representing a lot of really smart people doing a lot of good work. And what I'm showing right now are the most current uh, national data on disproportionality in school discipline that Dan Lowson and his colleagues um, from the Civil Rights Project uh, and the Center for Civil Rights Remedies have developed. And what you can see here, this is uh, national data, like I was describing, for out-of-school suspension rates across the country by elementary and secondary school. So you can see in the dark bar is the percent of students from each group who have been suspended out of school at least once during the school year. And then the lighter bar is secondary. And so if you look at your screen, the one all the way on the left is the overall number. So overall, 2.6% of students in elementary school were suspended out of school at some point, and 10.1% in secondary schools. And then what you can see across is, is uh, once you disaggregate these data, you can see some big differences. And just so you know, if you're playing the disproportionality metric home game, these are also known as risk indices. So this is the uh, risk of any one of these students of receiving out-of-school discipline, uh, out-of-school suspension at one time during the school year. And if you look, it's not too difficult to see that um, the group with the greatest risk for out-of-school suspension is black students. That's both in elementary school and in secondary school. And then the second largest group is students with disabilities. And um, the group that's got the most disproportionality is black students with disabilities. In fact, in this, um, in a different report, but on the same sample nationwide, um, two, uh, two out of every 10 school districts across the country 
suspended more than half of their black students with disabilities in secondary schools during the school year, more than half. So that's really big. Um, now, one way to look at this and to, to be able to make some comparisons is to look and say, okay, well, I can see the one bar is big and one bar is small, but how do we can tell the magnitude of the difference? What I'm going to do is I'm going to put some lines across here so you can see. This is the line for white students in elementary school, 1.6%, and then you can see which groups are above and below that bar. And those comparisons, if you divide that, uh, the number for the group you're looking at by white students, you end up getting something called a risk ratio. And here's the bar at secondary school. You can see some very large differences for some of our students. And because you're tuning into this webinar, you probably already know this information. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to move really quickly here, assuming that you are committed to this and want to move forward with it. So um, one of the challenges that we run into when we're presenting in front of groups is we get um, uh, people acknowledge that this disproportionality is there, but sometimes um, there are some questions about the data and, and maybe wondering if race really makes as big of a difference as these numbers kind of show. What I'd like to do is sort of share some of those questions that people commonly ask and then some responses to that. The one common question that we get is the question about poverty. You know, maybe uh, because of the correlation between race and poverty, uh, what we really see is um, that uh, poverty is the risk factor and race is not really the risk factor. And we actually have research from plenty of studies over the last decade showing that even when we control for uh, poverty in a school or poverty from an individual student, we still see a significant effect of race on um, uh, school discipline disparities. So it's still there even without, uh, even when you consider poverty. So another one, are some groups just more violent than others? So do we see more problem behavior because some groups just have more problem behavior and that's why we see differences? Once again, we don't have any research showing that that's the case. And in fact, we have a plenty of studies showing the, uh, showing the opposite, that we have no evidence for it. Uh, one of my good friends and colleagues, Catherine Bradshaw, um, her work in 2010 looked at teacher ratings of student problem behavior and then compared those teacher ratings to how often those students were sent to the office and saw that uh, black students were sent to the office more significantly more often than other groups, even when controlling for teacher ratings of their behavior. And then the last one that we often get. So, you know, are you saying then uh, that we're all racist and that's the main problem? Um, so this idea of overt racism, that what we're trying to do is um, all of us are consciously um, trying to uh, target certain groups. And the most recent research out there says that um, most disproportionality comes from unconscious or implicit bias, um, meaning um, that uh, it comes from actions we're not even aware um, that we're taking and that awareness is a really, really key part. You don't actually have to be um, uh, explicitly biased um, to, for disproportionality to take place. All right. So many of you probably have run into the same situation uh, as we have um, about bringing up this idea of racial bias and bringing up the idea of equity in school discipline but uh, having uh, running into a few challenges along the way, shall we say. Um, I like to show this road sign from Vietnam that I found. Um, it says, this way to the flower garden and this way to the nuclear reactor. And so often in schools, we see that conversation about race and education as the nuclear reactor. And we would do anything that we can to avoid that which often means we don't bring up the very important conversations that we absolutely have to have. So what we're going to do is lay out some assumptions that we have that, uh, that help create some ground rules for doing um, this work and actually addressing the challenge instead of either admiring it or ignoring it. Number one, as we come from a standpoint that everybody 
who's in education believes that a student's color should not fate him or her to negative outcomes. Number two, that talking about race and equity is inherently uncomfortable and we need to embrace that discomfort and not just shy away from something. Number three though, if we make those uncomfortable conversations happen, but we don't actually provide strategies of something to do differently in schools, it's not going to help us and it's probably going to make things worse. And then number four, of course, when we talk about equity, uh, we're going to make mistakes and we need to give each other the um, opportunity to make those mistakes and uh, continue to work, move forward together. So in looking at all of that and looking at number three, um, most importantly on there, providing strategies, um, we at the Disproportionality Work Group from the Center on PBIS have developed a set of free resources for addressing equity in school discipline. And it comes from a, uh, this five-point intervention approach. This um, document that you're seeing right now in the website below is where you can get it, is an overview of the five-point approach. And you can also get this and the materials that we've provided in those, that, that file box up in the top corner. Or if you're watching this after the event, uh, you can just go right to that page at the bottom. So for the rest of the time, we're going to talk about each one of these specific approaches. So number one, um, even though we're talking about school discipline, there's a very important connection between academic instruction and student behavior that is absolutely critical for us to address to uh, reduce what we call the support gap, uh, what's traditionally called the achievement gap. Um, the only reason why we call it the support gap is that if we can regularly predict, if we can see when students walk into kindergarten on day one and we know who is going to need, who is going to fall behind academically, that's really a support gap, not an, not an achievement gap. So we call that the support gap. Number two is building a behavior framework that's preventive, multi-tiered, and flexible enough to be adapted to the students, families, community, and staff uh, in your buildings. Um, and we recommend PBIS as one of those behavior frameworks that's, that's promising and has been helpful. Number three, collect, use, and report disaggregated discipline data. We have a data guide that you can download at the website or uh, on the files up in the corner. Uh, number four, develop policies with accountability for disciplinary equity. And number five, address uh, implicit bias by teaching strategies to identify when we're most likely to uh, have our unconscious biases uh, take over our discipline decisions and what to do instead of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the microphone over to Dr. Ron Denise and she is going to talk about number one. I'm going to be back for two and three. She's going to talk about number four and then I will be back for number five. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Hi, everybody. So I am going to be spending a brief moment talking about what we know in regards to academic instruction and, and its impact on reducing that uh, support gap that Kent had mentioned. Um, this document, like Ken had mentioned, uh, as well as everything else that we're going to be sharing is available on that website, pbis.org, and it's in the section, a section called Equity. Now before we start, we're going to go ahead and take a little look at a poll question that we have on instruction. I want you to think about it and answer it honestly, when you, when, whether it's your teaching practices or those of people in your district. One moment. So the question reads, to what extent do your teaching practices make engagement in instruction a requirement of all students? 
Thank you. Thank you for your honest answers. And what we're looking at, and, and I think probably what everyone was focusing on, is that requirement of all students. And the reason that I bring this up, and it's a key point in what we'll be looking at, is that oftentimes when, the, when we have students, whether they are English language learners or students who are struggling, we've all experienced in our own practices help, trying our very best to help our students out. And oftentimes that means giving them a pass. And what we have found is that's ineffective at reducing the gap. In fact, it increases it, as many of you would probably assume, because engagement in instruction should be a requirement of all students. But it is up to us as teachers of those students to provide opportunities in which students can engage without it being embarrassing or demeaning or challenging in a way that uh, does not match our students' instructional level. So when we discuss in the document um, focusing on academic instruction, what does it mean to, to create instruction that is engaging? We're talking about four specific factors that research has pointed to. One is explicit instruction, and as you PBISers know, we are very much focused on uh, being very explicit, very, very consistent, and making it known what our expectations are of our students. This ties into behavior and academic instruction equally. The next point is high rates of opportunities to respond. One of the slides I'm going to show you is, is it gives examples of what people can do uh, to increase rates of opportunities to respond. It's not just about calling on students or making sure that everybody gets, an, gets a chance to raise their hand and, and answer a question, but increasing opportunities to respond for all students um, includes opportunities like response cards or choral response, where everybody can shout out answers together. And so therefore, it may not highlight students who get the answer incorrect, for example. The third point is quality performance feedback. Students, as you know, need to know what they are doing right and what they are doing wrong. And the way in which they know that is by us providing them specific feedback on their responses, on what can be changed, on what they did correctly. And this is something that's very important for improving students' engagement and instruction. And the last one, of course, is using data for progress monitoring and making decisions about whether or not your students are responding to the instruction you're providing. In the, in the document that's available on PBIS.org, you'll find that we lay out these four strategies and we provide resources under evidence base that point to where in the literature um, these four points are highlighted. And of course, the purpose that they serve, just like I just discussed. And one example I wanted to share with you, well, two examples are in, within there, there are questions for each of our four points on how to guide lesson planning. And these are really questions for your educators to be asking themselves. So for example, under priming background knowledge, asking yourself, do I have a basic understanding of my students' cultures and how that might affect their background knowledge, participation, or understanding of new knowledge? This is very key because priming background knowledge can only be done when we know what that background knowledge is. And having a greater understanding of your students will improve that. Now, in, under opportunities res to respond, like I had discussed, there are many different ways to do this in which it makes engagement and in instruction a requirement. Here's a question saying, did I engage my students in observable ways, such as response cards, choral readings, or other method methods during teacher-directed instruction? Being able to give teachers a way to reflect on their own practices is important. And being able to think about observable ways in which we engage students is one of our best indicators to know whether or not they are engaged. Lastly, there is an example of a third grade vocabulary lesson that is provided in the document. And this uh, lesson goes through kind of explicitly what it would look like when running this vocabulary lesson and including those four components um, for engaging instruction with your students. Now, before I turn it back over to Kent, we wanted to share this data from a local school district here in Oregon that made a concerted effort starting back in 2007 to focus on improving the instruction that they were providing to all students. They had examined their data. They saw, as you can see, that there was a large gap between the green line is Latino students, the blue line, or purple, for however your computer looks, is their white peers. And there was 
a, a large gap in how students were responding to instruction and how they were performing. And this was based on um, their standards, meeting or exceeding their standards in reading. And when they put these practices into place with the four that we had that I highlighted, they saw over a period of time, this is coming up until 2012, 2013, that they have really, really closed that gap. They've provided opportunities for all of their students to engage in instruction and provided their teachers with the support to really understand the needs of the students that are in their classrooms. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Ken uh, to take it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Rhonda. And uh, at this point, I'm going to answer a question from Sarah out there. Not giving students a pass, how do you navigate the pressure applied from admin and counseling staff to excuse students from work? This is a really interesting question, and it highlights the nuanced sort of balancing acts that you've got to do with academic instruction um, that's really key. So I don't have an absolute answer, but trying to understand, we don't want to call on students if we're absolutely sure that they're not going to get it right and it's going to be embarrassing. And one of the key ways of doing that is to really check and make sure that we're providing students the opportunities to respond for um, academic skills that are in their instructional zone. So the so ones that they're going to be more likely than not to get the answer correct. Thank you for those questions. All right, so I'm going to move on to number two, which is uh, why start with a foundation of PBIS? Remember, this is our, our uh, behavior framework that is multi-tiered preventive and flexible to be culturally responsive. So I'm going to put a, um, a little bit of information on theoretically why PBIS in of itself might actually be uh, um, a, a good place to start for us here. Um, so number one, when we use a proactive instructional approach where we, instead of assuming that students know all of the routines in the classroom, all of the next steps, um, that what we do is we actually teach them all of those things. We take that hidden curriculum of the assumptions that we make about students uh, and what they know, and we make that visible. That's a really key point. Another one is uh, if we've got a system like PBIS where we have tools for improving student-teacher relationships, we're going to build up those relationships so when there are times when we really need to um, essentially make a withdrawal on that bank account, we don't end up with a message that says you have insufficient funds. If we've built that relationship with students and then we can step in and correct them as needed. Number three, when we take our referral procedures, our discipline policies, and we make them more objective as opposed to subjective, we can reduce some of the ambiguity in the discipline decisions that we make. And ambiguity is disproportionality's best friend. The more unclear, the more vague our discipline systems are, the more likely implicit bias is to influence our discipline decisions. And then the last one, if we can provide uh, school personnel with responses other than simply sending a student out of the classroom or sending a student out of school, then we're going to keep students in that instructional environment learning with their peers more often and be able to give them those skills. Um, as Rhonda has often uh, said, you cannot punish skills into a child. So those were the um, uh, that was the theory behind it, but let's look at actually some of the research of uh, effects of PBS on discipline disproportionality. Um, number one, Claudia Vincent and colleagues uh, did an evaluation study comparing schools, a lot of schools implementing PBIS uh, to schools not implementing PBIS and saw a statistically significantly lower black-white discipline gap in office referral <laughs> that decreased over the years as opposed to increased. In another study, looking at uh, office referrals, um, a, a different uh, sample saw that there were decreases in office referrals, um, not just for white students, but across all racial or ethnic groups. 
in some case study work, uh, we've seen larger decreases in discipline, uh, in exclusionary discipline for students of color rather than white students. And then finally, uh, some of those similar um, reductions in exclusionary discipline in indigenous or uh, native run schools. But we know that there are some parts of PBIS that might be more effective in terms of equity than others. So Terry Tobin and Claudia Vincent did this really interesting study where they looked at schools where they had improved the discipline gap, this black-white relative risk index, which, which is really just a way to count disproportionality and suspensions for a number of schools, and looked at what were the parts of PBIS that they were implementing that were most related to that change. And here were the two things. Number one, regular use of data for decision making understanding our numbers, regularly monitoring them, especially disaggregated data, and you taking that information and using it to change instruction to change what we do. In addition, implementing classroom PBIS systems was a key piece. And then they said, you know, let's look at classroom systems and let's see if there are some parts of classroom systems that were most related to change in equity. This is a list, if you're familiar with the um, PBIS self-assessment survey, sometimes called the SAS, uh, which you can use on pbisapps.org. Um, these are the uh, critical features of classroom systems. And you can see all of them on there. And take a look for a second and try to think. There were three that were most related to decreases in disproportionality in school discipline. Take a look, talk with your neighbors for half a second. If you're not watching live, you can pause it because I'm going to give you the answers in just a second. Okay, they were expected behaviors acknowledged regularly, transitions that are efficient and orderly, and problem behaviors that are defined clearly. So catching students doing things the right way. Uh, being really clear, thinking about when we think about teaching transitions in the classroom, that's often part of that hidden curriculum that we see where we might just assume that students know how to move from one activity to the next without explicitly teaching them that. Um, and then the last one has to do with that question of ambiguity in our problem behaviors. If we've got some really vague definitions of problem behaviors, then we're going to get into lots of trouble in terms of disproportionality. Okay, so looking at that, um, here are some key recommendations for enhancing the cultural responsiveness of PBIS implementation. Number one, make sure that in addition to decreasing the discipline gap, you have assessed and decreased, if necessary, the acknowledgement gap. Uh, that acknowledgement gap meaning that some students are receiving uh, access to praise or uh, any kind of PBIS reward systems inequitably based on student group. Number two, when we build our systems or when we revise our systems, it's absolutely vital that we involve families, students, and the community so that we don't unintentionally make our systems work really, really well for the adults sitting around the table uh, in the school. Um, and uh, inadvertently exclude the voice, exclude the experiences, or, or um, disempower some students' uh, cultural backgrounds just because they're not there at the table when we're deciding what's okay and what's not okay. And finally, using regular students and family surveys to assess acceptability and fit. So here's a little look at a school here, and you can see if you um, look closely enough, what unintentional messages are we providing for students? This is a uh, school that is their mascot is the dogs, welcome home of the dogs, and then you see the sign at the bottom says, no dogs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a poll out here for you. Take a look and ask yourself this question. To what extent do you feel like you have tailored your PBIS systems to meet the needs of your specific student populations. 
Uh, the middle choice is very popular. All right, get those last clicks in. All right, a very small number saying a great deal, a very big number saying somewhat, which is a little encouraging, and then some very uh, brave and honest people, about one in five, saying eh, not really. Well, let me give you a tool that could be really useful for doing that very same thing. We've developed, and I know you won't be able to see it unless you're really, really squinting at your screen, a survey of students asking them about their experiences with PBIS systems in your school or behavior systems in your school if you're not implementing PBIS. It has some basic demographic questions so we can disaggregate that. Um, questions about expectations. Do you know how your teachers want you to behave at school? Do you like the expectations? If not, what should they be? Are the expectations for behavior at school the same as they are at your home? Do students usually follow the expectations? Do teachers usually follow the expectations? And then questions that let you assess that acknowledgement gap. This tool uh, will be available very soon on PBIS.org and will also, hopefully by this spring, make it available on PBIS apps so you can actually administer this electronically to your students. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, an activity. And this is a great tool that's coming from uh, our friends in Wisconsin, Melanie Leverson and Kent Smith, who um, are developing uh, with uh, the rest of some of us a guide on cultural responsiveness in PBIS. Most of you are familiar with the school-wide expectations matrix. We use it to clarify what's expected, make that hidden curriculum visible, focus on what to do instead of what not to do. So here's a picture where we've got our expectations here. We've got all of our settings across the school. Here is an interesting little tweak on that, and it's called a personal matrix. And this is an activity that you can do with students. You could do this at the beginning of the year. You could do this at the middle of the year. You could do it um, uh, possibly even regularly throughout and refresh it. Uh, but it's a tool to take those expectations and see how are things different across different settings, not within the school, but outside of school. I'm going to show you what that looks like here. Here's what you would provide to students. Here you've got your three expectations in your school. Be safe, be respectful, be responsible. And then you, as the school personnel, have filled in what these expectations look like at school. And then ask the students to fill in what does it look like at home, and then what does it look like in my neighborhood. And what you can do is you can assess where there are big differences. And you might say, well, maybe we need to tweak our school systems to make it a little, look a little bit more like students and families. Or you might say, you know what? We need to, at our school, need to have this clear definition that might be a little bit different. You know, look at be safe across there. And that signals to us that we need to teach that a little bit better. And this personal matrix can be a way to do that. Number three that I'm not going to describe too much here is using disaggregated data to assess and address equity. We've got a great data guide that walks you through the specific <coughs> steps for doing this right here. Um, and I'm going to just pull over here just a, a quick question. Um, and that is, what metrics do you use to measure disproportionality in your schools? So here are your options that you've got. Risk index, that percent of students who received a particular outcome. Risk ratio, which is dividing the risk index by a, um, by a, a comparison group, which is almost always white students. Relative risk index, which is slightly different. Oh, we almost had a vote there, but then somebody changed it off there. Uh, other, and then I don't know. So it's really, really key. If you are in that I don't know category, which is great, and thank you for being honest. Take a look at that data guide, and it's going to be really, really helpful for you in terms of seeing what are the things that you're going to be able to do to count. So you might use a, a data system like SWIST, the school-wide information system, which allows you to automatically produce disaggregated uh, discipline data automatically without any calculations. It gives you the risk indices for each one of your groups and lets you drill down. I'm going to show you that in just a little bit. 
Um, and I'm going to hand it over now to Rhonda, who's going to talk about policy. Thanks, Kent. We're doing a little presentation ping pong over here. So thank you, guys. Um, OK, so we are going to be talking right now just for uh, a couple minutes about policies. and. Um, There we go. So along with all of the other materials, this too is available on PBIS.org. This is really talking about the policies that are set at the district and the school practices that reflect those policies and how those policies, in addition to the school practices, can actually address that discipline disproportionality um, as, as we've been discussing. So. Let's talk about how implementing a policy with accountability for equity could work. Um, it could highlight a common priority. So oftentimes you could see, you might see that the priority is to, you know, examine the data and to reduce the, the risk ratio or whatever you are examining or to provide more opportunities to students who are not typically engaged in learning um, or to reduce uh, the number of out of school suspensions at your school or your district has. It could highlight a common priority, and that priority could be possibly based on an issue that you're seeing in your data. It could reduce the effects of explicit bias. It could enable implementation of other aspects of equity interventions. So other aspects of equity interventions, such as utilizing data, such as improving your instructional practices, or tying your PBIS systems to more appropriately fit the community that you're serving. It could re reduce the use of discriminatory practices, right? So when we're talking about ambiguity being um, disproportionality's best friend, it could possibly reduce ambiguity. Why? Be, by creating systems that are a lot more explicit. Explicit in the way in which you want your educators to behave or respond to behavior, to behave or respond to problem behaviors, or um, explicit in our expectations for our students. Now let's take a look at an example of a mission statement that really tried its best to address um, the issue of inequity in education. So this says, the teachers, administrators, and staff of the LA Unified School District believe in the equal worth and dignity of all students and are committed to educate all students to their maximum potential. This policy statement sounds very nice. It is a very nice statement. It sounds pretty consistent with a mission statement, but it doesn't explicitly say what they will do to uh, reflect this belief, this belief in the equal worth. And this mission statement did nothing for LA Unified. It didn't help them at all. What did help was when they removed the practice of teachers being allowed to suspend students without getting an administrator's approval first. This was a practice that was utilized in LA Unified for a while, and when they did away with that, that changed things. It was explicit and it was direct. Now when we talk about things that are ineffective, because again, you could look at that mission statement and say, well, this is lovely. Is that, is that appropriate? There's nothing inappropriate about it, but what we want are policies that actually tell our students, tell our teachers, tell our communities, our families, what we are going to do. So general guidance on equity, ineffective. Right? It may not be harmful, but it's not going to do anything. What is effective? The removal of zero tolerance policies or suspensions for nonviolent offenses. That is effective in improving uh, discipline in your schools and or reducing the disproportionality in discipline in your schools. Right? Because as many of us know, that zero tolerance predominantly targeted students of color. What is ineffective? Including commitment to equity in a mission statement. Again, it sounds nice, but it doesn't do anything. What would be an effective practice? Or, as you see in the limited research section, are things that some of us are doing with our PBIS practices, right? That second box says clear objective discipline procedures, such as defining your ODRs, um, clarifying staff versus office managed problem behaviors. Those things are very, very important to reduce ambiguity. But in addition to that, Regularly sharing disproportionality data with um, administrators, with school staff for accountability and for decision making is what works. We've seen this with other aspects of PBIS, that keeping, um, that regularly sharing out of data with the rest of your staff is one of those 
key indicators of sustainability. It helps people keep the machine going. So now let's look at a policy example that really does bring accountability into it. This one says, the board directs the superintendent to develop and update a detailed action plan to address equity with multiple metrics <laughs> to assess progress in reducing inequities in school discipline. The action plan shall identify district leads and clear procedures for school staff. The superintendent will share the plan and report on progress towards these goals to the board at least twice per year. Lack of progress towards these goals may be considered grounds for dismissal. So this policy obviously spells out specifically what is going to be done about addressing equity, right? Using multiple sources of data, sharing out twice a year, having clear action plans. And this is something that could be effective in uh, changing the, 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 the inequity in discipline. It's not going to fix everything, you know, and I think that's, that's the issue with these policies is that they're not going to fix the problem, but they are something that gives another, uh, another measurement of accountability and a way to check in and make sure that our practices are consistent and our practices are addressing the issues that we see. So now you're probably wondering what does not work in policy because you guys probably have many policies that you've seen across your districts and your states. Enacting policies that nobody knows about. So having policies that are buried on your district's website in a long document with lots of numbers and lots of jargon that a lawyer probably scanned over many times for you is not effective. If nobody knows about it, nothing's going to be done. Enacting policies that don't change practices. So in the guide that is available on pbis.org, for every one of the policy uh, guide or uh, uh, district policy features that we spell out um, are school practices and district practices that would reflect that policy. Policies are ineffective if they don't change practices, but oftentimes we, w we don't know what practices are indicators of that policy. Policies without accountability for implementation. So not only does nobody know about it, but nobody's making sure that it's happening or that things are changing. Those are the things that really do not work. Now here are some of our recommendations. So including a specific commitment to equity is important. Creating mission statements that include equity, enacting hiring practices for equitable discipline, and installing effective practices clear objective school discipline procedures. Um, this is something that's so important because what we see many times in districts, whether large or small, are that discipline procedures look different from school to school. So in districts in which equity is a commitment and something of importance, being able to have discipline procedures that are consistent across our schools and are being managed in a, in, in a way of, of accountability, being able to collect the data and look at across schools what discipline procedures are being used. Supporting the implementation of positive proactive approaches to discipline, so being preventative, and replacing exclusionary practices with instructional ones. So we're not just, like, like Kent had mentioned and gave me credit for, we're not punishing skills into a kid, right? We're not just going to keep suspending kids who keep doing something wrong, but what are we going to do to actually teach those students what appropriate behaviors in schools look like? What is expected of them when they enter or re-enter the classroom in which they got kicked out of? How do we replace those exclusionary practices or embed instructional ones within the ones that already exist? And lastly, creating accountability for efforts. So creating teams and procedures to enhance equity um, so with, the, with the policy that I had shared out, you know, having um, a measure or saying how many times a year that data is going to be examined, what's going to be looked at, and having outcomes that are tied to it. All right, now for our implicit bias, I am sending the ball back to Kent for this one. Thank you. Thank you again, Rhonda. So here's number five on our list. Um, how can we reduce implicit bias in our decision making? Um, this, it's helpful, and we're not really going to be able to do it in the last 15 minutes of this, to be able to go into great detail about um, the research into decision making. 
But a very straightforward way of looking at it is to, is to look at some pictures of uh, how disproportionate discipline happens and how it's related to racial bias. There's sort of an old school version of this that says, you know, everybody has some level of racial bias, which is actually true, uh, and that's the thing that leads to disproportionate discipline. But a more modern view of it, and actually a more helpful view, says there are actually some situations where our biases are more prevalent, are more likely to influence our decisions, and some where we're more likely to be um, more equitable in our decisions. So uh, let's talk about this thing called implicit bias. I know I mentioned it briefly before and talked about that it was unconscious, but here's some basic info. Number one, it's unconscious or automatic, mean it, meaning that it operates without our conscious thought. These are our snap judgments that we make. These are our first impressions that we make without even thinking about it. Uh, our brains have moved forward in trying to classify uh, people and situations. And that comes from stereotypes. That comes from either um, some experiences we've had, thing, uh, ways that we've been raised, but often uh, with uh, the media and, um, and how different groups are portrayed on the media. Number three, we all have some levels of implicit bias. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, at a group level, even those who are affected by it um, often have implicit biases against their group. Um, but it is generally not uh, a reflection of the way that we feel that we ought to behave. Uh, and it's not, a, not necessarily lines up with our stated values about how children should be educated, about how people should be treated. And it's more likely, as I was describing in the last slide, more likely to influence a few specific kinds of decisions. Snap decisions, ones that we've got to make really, really quickly, and decisions that are ambiguous, where it's a little bit unclear what the, you know, quote-unquote right answer is. And you might be starting to think about some of those discipline decisions and uh, which ones are more ambiguous than others. Here's some research on this idea of implicit bias out there. These are sort of uh, a little bit silly, but just to give you a little bit of a sense of what this looks like. Um, some researchers have looked at implicit attractiveness bias, where they've taken headshots of real estate agents in one city and then shown them to people in another city and have them rate on a scale of 1 to 10 how attractive these people are. And it turns out that those attractiveness ratings are very strongly related to how much these people sell houses for. Probably not something that you would think about when you're thinking about who you want to hire. Uh, also, height. Um, correcting for age and gender, one inch of height is worth almost $1,000 a year in salary. Now, every single person around is looking around at the people next to them um, to see uh, how that matches. Um, and I like to provide some of those um, uh, a, little bit, a little bit funny examples only because um, I want to get people really comfortable with the notion before we start talking about the uncomfortable discussion with race. And I like to start when we talk about this from a quote from Nicholas Kristof who uh, writes to the New York Times, the challenge is not a small number of twisted white supremacists but something infinitely more subtle and complex. People who believe in equality but act in ways that perpetuate bias and inequality. This is that distinction between explicit bias or overt, uh, overt bias or overt racism and implicit bias. There's a great book if you're interested in uh, reading more about it called Blind Spot. And the full title of this, which I think is really useful, is um, The Hidden Biases of Good People. Um, which really, I think, highlights the key parts, especially for educators. We do not have um, teachers in this country who wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to send all of my black boys to the office today. But yet that pattern happens on a regular basis. Um, so how can we see this uh, evidence of implicit bias in society? Here's some pictures showing that. These are, um, from the FBI, arrest rates for marijuana possession by race. 
and you see the uh, for the last for uh, 10 years. The red bar is the white arrest rate. The black bar is the black arrest rate. Okay. What I'm going to do is show you data from um, uh, a national survey on drug abuse and health, and this is self-reported marijuana use among 18 to 25 year olds. Okay, you see the pattern, right? Here's arrest rates, here's use. If anything, we should see more white people being arrested than black people, just based on this information. But that's that implicit bias part. If anybody remembers back to the DOJ report on the Ferguson Police Department, um, here's a really, really telling part of that. Um, this was a statistic that they calculated, and they used uh, something called a risk ratio. And what they found is that controlling for the reason for the stop, for, these are traffic stops, controlling for that reason of the stop, African-American motorists were more than twice as likely that's a risk ratio of 2.07, times more likely to be searched than white uh, motorists during a vehicle stop, but were 26% less likely to have drugs or weapons on them um, during a search. So it starts leaning toward who are the people who we pull over, who are the people who we assume um, are uh, up to no good. Um, so thinking about some of the decisions that we make, um, Daniel Kahneman has this, uh, uh, describes um, two kinds of decisions or two systems that our brains use for decision making in the world. And they happen at the same time, but they happen at, uh, uh, the decisions are made for different kinds of scenarios. Um, his book has been translated into lots of different languages around the world. There's Dutch. So system one is fast decisions. These ones are our snap judgments, our quick decisions that we've got to make right away, and often we've made a decision without even thinking about it. Contrast that with system two, which is slow decisions. These are decisions where we can think about it for a little bit, where we can um, uh, really decide. This is sort of us making our list of pros and cons and deciding you know, what would be, in the, uh, for example, in the student's best interest, what's going to help this student out the most, which is different from our first reaction, perhaps. Um, so I'm going to lay out here, and it's difficult to have a discussion during a webinar, but um, what decisions in schools are more likely to be snap judgments? So take a look at these up on the screen. I'm not going to provide too much time for you to look at it, but if you're watching this later, you can pause and um, pick it up. But we've, these are sorted into different patterns. Which ones are more likely to be snap judgments? Okay, here are the answers. The ones on the left are fast decisions, things that we've got to do really, really quickly more often. The ones on the right are slow decisions. These are ones where we really can stop and think about it. Sometimes people think that suspending a student from school is a fast decision. But really, you know, if you've got 30 seconds to think about it, you are fooling yourself if you're thinking it's a fast decision. It's actually a slow decision. And this keys into some helpful information for us in terms of intervention, that the key point um, to starting out looking at biases is awareness. A nice quote from my colleague Rosemary Allen from, the, from UC Denver, if you're aware, you're halfway there. But what do we do with this awareness? What I'm going to describe to you is something um, very, very quickly called a vulnerable decision point, or what we call a VDP. Those are specific, in this case, discipline decisions that are more vulnerable to implicit bias than others. And there are two parts that come of it. One is the elements of the situation, and then one is how we're feeling when we're making these decisions. So we've got a few different ways that we can do this. Uh, I'm going to show you, number two, I'm going to show you some national data, and, um, and then I want to encourage you to start moving toward three and four and looking at, um, at more specific stuff if the national data don't match. Um, and the discipline data guide walks you through how to identify these VDPs with your discipline data. Um, so one example of a system that's been designed specifically to allow you to do this is SWISS. And what you do is you go into this um, uh, section called drill down. You add your groups, 
and you start looking at what are the patterns by group and then switch back and forth, switch these filters on and off to see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some national data right now really quickly. Um, over 3 million referrals, uh, over 6,000 schools. And here are the things that we see nationally. Number one, when problem behavior is subjective as opposed to more objective like um, skipping class or smoking, um, we see more discipline disproportionality. Defiance, disrespect, and disruption are the key ones. Also, the distinction between whether I'm going to handle this in the classroom versus whether I need to send a student to the office. Those tie into that ambiguity that I was describing before. Also, non-classroom areas, hallways. Maybe it's that we don't know those students, so we're relying on that quick snap judgment about them. Classrooms. Um, it could be academic demands. It could be the relevance of instruction. It could be the student-teacher relationship. And the last one, afternoons, and that's fatigue. Um, that's fatigue on the adult decision maker at this point. We're more likely to have our biases influence our decisions when we're a little bit more tired. So now we actually have some national data on what are the situations that we've got to watch out for. Um, as I described before, there's a term called resource depletion that describes that fatigue. There's some very disturbing research out there on judges and um, how um, proximity to uh, lunch or snack um, uh, has a, a, an inordinate effect on um, their parole decisions. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend really quickly describe what to do when we figure that out. Um, and this is what's called a neutralizing routine. So first we want to ask ourselves, hey, are we in one of those situations or those VDPs? Um, it could be the situation, it could be how we feel. If that's the case, then we want to use an alternative response. I'm going to show you what this looks like in a picture here. If this is a description of my behavior here as a teacher in the classroom, where I'm more likely to send a student to the office when I haven't had a lot of positive interactions with students or I'm tired, um, and there have been loud complaints about um, uh, work by a particular student, which I could view as um, you know, good constructive criticism of my level of differentiation of instruction, or I could view as defiance, and my snap judgment is to send a student to the office. That's defiance. We don't tolerate that in this classroom. You're out of here. Student gets out of class, I get out of class, um, I get away from that student. What we want to do with these neutralizing routines is create a little bit of space in between student behavior and our response to it. And so what that means is having a self-assessment of saying, hey, wait, is this one of those vulnerable decision points? Am I in the right state to respond to the student right now? And if so, then I'm going to use an alternative response instead of sending a student out of class. In this case, it's see me after class. There's some research out there on what things are effective for neutralizing routines. They've got to be quick. They've got to be if-then statements. got to be clear. It's got to be doable. And it's got to be something that slows down that chain of events. So here are a few examples. I'm just going to lay these out on the screen. These are ones that we've either developed or um, had um, provided to us from teachers with whom we've worked. There are lots of different things that you might actually use as a neutralizing routine. And the key part is that they match those critical features, not that you have any one in particular. All right. So then you could also use that as pre-correction before a difficult situation where you know there's going to be a challenge. I'm about to walk into the hallways, and I know from my school data that that's the case. Uh, also, from the administrator um, decision point, we've only talked about staff decisions, but the strongest predictor of disproportionality in school discipline is the extent to which the school principal feels that exclusionary discipline and zero tolerance actually works. So we actually have neutralizing routines for administrators that we recommend, too. When you have to handle unwanted behavior, stop and tell yourself. Instead of don't just stand there, do something, don't just do something, stand there. Remember, these are slow decisions. They're not fast decisions. 
Make sure that you're in a good situation to, um, to respond to students. Get information from students and staff. Assess the student-teacher relationship and see if there's something with that going on there. And then whenever possible, use an agreed-upon instructional response as opposed to simply sending a student out of school. We're going to end with this last piece here looking at something called the restorative chat. This is a set of seven questions that an administrator can use um, to help build student relationships, to help student-teacher relationships, to help build skills as opposed to just excluding a student based on their behavior. So we are out of time at this point. Uh, we want to thank you very much for attending and um, appreciate all of the hard work that you're going to do. Please take some of these steps and start using them as soon as possible. Uh, be in touch with us and we would be more than happy to answer your further questions. Thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day.